This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to JAX.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have as guest Loy Lu, who is the co-founder of Kyber Network. Kyber Network aims to be a decentralized exchange protocol that has features which would approach, uh, which would make decentralized exchange technology accessible to end users. We are going to take a survey of the decentralized exchange field, talk about the challenges of building such exchanges and zoom in on Kyber Network. Before we start, Loy, welcome to the show. Thanks for the introduction. Yep. And thanks for having me. So, so Loy, you have been a researcher at the National University of Singapore, right? Yes. Tell us, tell us how you got interested in the cryptocurrency space as a researcher. Right, so I first heard about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain back in uh, late 2013, uh, but not until like mid 2014 I started working on it. Um, so the idea of payment system that is trustless and you know operates in an open network attracted me, you know, as a good research topic. So since 2014, uh, I have kept working on cryptocurrencies and and blockchain uh, during my PhD. And I was one of a few, uh, you know, PhD students working on the topic back then, uh, including many well-known ones like Andrew Miller, uh, Christian Decker, and other other devices. Um, so, so to date, I have uh, written and published several um, academic papers on, you know, top security top security conferences uh, about cryptocurrency. To to name a few, you you might have heard about ONT and about Smart Pool. And uh, these are, you know, two of my work in my PhD. Can you talk a bit about uh, uh, these two projects and how they led you to become involved in the uh, Kyber Network? Yeah, so, uh, so Oriente is the uh, first open source smart contract analyzers that allows you like, to check uh, whether your smart contract has any security vulnerability. So the idea is that, uh, you know, you just need to, to you know, send your contract to Oriente. And ONT will just you know try to explore all the all the possible execution part of the program or of the smart contract, and then for every part, it will check whether uh, you know the contract has any uh, security uh, as defined in the tool. And for smart pool, it's, it's, it's a uh, first decentralized and efficient pool mining protocol for cryptocurrencies using smart contract. Uh, so if you uh, if you see in uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you have like several like two or three mining pools uh, which account for more than 50 percent of the mining power in the network and these you know two or three pools can just you know collude and you know do whatever to the network right so um, the the goal of smart pool is to you know to to replace all the mining pools uh, with with a smart contract so that people don't have to trust the the, the pool operator and and everyone can be you know uh, can can monitor uh, can 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 monitor the uh, the uh, mining pool, so there's no single point of trust anymore. And and we have uh, deployed and and maintain mine, uh, smart pool in uh, in the mainnet, and so far we have mined uh, more than one hundred you know blocks on Ethereum uh, network. So you, you mentioned earlier that you t worked uh, uh, in your PhD, you worked on some of the early versions of uh, TrueBit. Uh, can you talk about that and, and how that work led into the work that you're doing now with Kyber Network? Back in 2015, I, I wrote uh, the Verifier Dilemma paper with Jason, uh, who is the, the co-founder of TrueBit now. So the, 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 the high-level idea of Verifier Dilemma is that, you know, uh, if you ask a cryptocurrency network to, to do a lot of computation on chain, then there's a, de uh, there's a dilemma that you know, the verifiers, they, they don't know whether they should verify the computation or not. Because 
either way they do, they will be vulnerable to some attack, right? Uh, so that's why, you know, uh, so that's why the TrueBit project exists to, to address the, the, the problem. So the idea is that you can still do, do a lot of, you know, computation, but, you know, only some of them will happen on chain and the rest of the computation will happen off chain, right? I have been, you know, focusing on, on you know, security and, and scalability of the decentralized application. And, and you know, uh, from Smartful, ONT, and, and TrueBit, and Verifier uh, Dilemma. Um, and still, you know, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum advocate a trustless and decentralized environment. Uh, that changes the ways that people transact and, and manage their digital asset. Yes, still, you know, it changes. Uh, the most critical, cr uh, critical part of the network are still uh, heavily decentralized. Uh, because if, if you see uh, currently, you know, more than, 90, more, more than 99% of the daily trading volume happens on centralized exchanges. And, you know, big exchanges, they keep getting hacked. So either due to, you know, external hackers or due to internal fraud. And that, you know, put users' fund and personal information at risk. Uh, so that's the main, you know, motivation to, to motivate us to work on Kyber Network. So just, just to recap, the, I, th I think I remember the, the verifier's dilemma is this problem where if I have a proof and I, I, I want you to be able to verify it, I have to send. So I send you the proof and then you have to have the proof that this is a valid proof. And then I have to have the proof that you received the, the valid proof. I mean, it's, can, can you can you sort of walk us through what is right. the verifier's dilemma? Because uh, I, I, my, uh, my cryptography theory is a little, uh, my proof of verify theory is a little rusty right now. Right. Uh, so uh, in the in the verifier dilemma, what happens is that you have some computation that you want uh, the network to to do, right? Uh, so what you do is you you upload the computation to the to the cryptocurrency network, and later on when you submit some input, the entire network has like to do the computation and compute the output, right? And verify the output themselves, right? But, you know, uh, so some people like, you know, get reward for doing that, like, you know, the miners, they, they who, who, who find the block, but some people do not get any reward uh, when, when they verify the output, right? Because, because the, 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 the generation fee is, is sent to the only, uh, to the only miner, not, not to others. So that's why there's a, there's a dilemma there. So whether should I verify the, the, the output or should I just skip it and work on the next block? So if I verify, I, I don't receive anything and I might be, you know, vulnerable to some attack because, you know, the, the miners can just, the miner who, who find the block can just, you know, put a lot of computation there just to delay my, uh, the, the, the process of mining the next block from my miners, right? And if, if, I, if, I, uh, if I don't verify, then maybe the block is invalid, so who knows? So I, I may, you know, have the risk of mining on top of invalid blocks and wasting my mining power, so that's that's you know there's a dilemma there. And how does that tie into the work that you're doing uh, at uh, at Kyber Network? But perhaps let's 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 use this to, to segue into decentralized exchanges. Um, how does your your research and your work in in the fair with regards to the verifies dilemma uh, play into uh, this idea of a decentralized exchange? Right, so I guess it's, it's not much uh, related between, uh, you know, Verifier Dilemma and, and uh, Kyber Network, but there's the connection between Smart Pool and, and Kyber Network, right? So can, can, can we, like, you know, focus on that? Okay, so, so um, I have been, you know, focusing on, on developing, like, decentralized uh, protocol, which is efficient and, and practical. Uh, one of the examples is, is Smart Pool uh, that, that, uh, that you know, allows miners, you know, from all over, all over the world, they, they can just, you know, uh, mine together uh, via the smart contract instead of via some centralized servers. Um, so I, I, cont I continue the, the, the theme of this, you know, work in Kyber Network by, uh, you know, developing a decentralized exchange for cryptocurrencies, which is scalable and practical. I mean, decentralized exchanges, of course, have been this now quite old dream right of the of the cryptocurrency space like like even when you go through like bitcoin talk uh, in 2012 or 2013 people were talking about and inventing decentralized uh, exchange protocols 
and over the years like the designs have changed a lot but uh, decentralized exchange technology hasn't really broken into the crypto mainstream right it still remains this, this right. fringe thing that people do i think the big change has been that uh back three or four years back there was just theoretical protocols now there are actual implementations where there are low trading volumes right? exactly so like like give us an overview of what makes this decentralized exchange problem hard why has it taken actually so much time to even build the first few implementations yeah i i would say uh, making a secure you know decentralized chain is easy but making it usable is hard because you know if you look at like bitcoin back in 2014 you know not many people heard about cryptocurrency right but once you know ethereum started uh, and you know uh, like making it easier for people to understand and and to and to use cryptocurrency more and more people like you know understand about cryptocurrency and started using it so it's it's more about you know usability uh, than you know uh, security in terms of adoption right so i think we can apply the same uh, analogy to to uh, decentralized exchanges because now with ethereum we can you know easily build like usable uh, decentralized exchanges uh, which is actually like easy for people to to use and doesn't require them to you know uh, set up or you know to understand the entire uh, concept behind it um, yeah so i guess it it wasn't like you know uh, practical and and feasible before so what are sort of the ideal features of a decentralized exchange right let's say let's say assume like 10 years down the line there'll be the perfect decentralized exchange what features must that exchange have in order right. to be usable right um so i guess there are a few features so first of all uh it, it must be secure and and trustless right because otherwise we can just use some centralized chains and secondly it's going to be the user friendliness like you know it must be um easy for people to use uh even like you know non technical users um the trading cost must be cheap because you know if it's if it's expensive to use then then no one want to use it um there must be like liquidity because um you know because when you want to trade there must be you know some someone else uh to to, to trade with you right so uh, I guess these are the few properties that you know any decentralized chains must must have in order to get you know uh, mass adoption. So trustlessness here implying that when I'm doing an exchange, there there is no point in the cycle of an exchange. So when I'm exchanging say Ethereum like Ether for Ethereum Classic, yeah, yeah, it's for ETC with you. At no point in the cycle of this exchange is there um. As a single party that can um, that can run away with our funds, right? That can choose not to honor our our funds. Not only that, right? So there is also the risk of the you know some party which doesn't match you with the best you know counterparty. So so for now you you still have to trust the centralized chains to match you with the best uh, you know counterparty. So so somebody not being able to run away with the funds is security. Yeah. It's that is what security means here. Like, and trustlessness here means that if there is like a matching algorithm or like there's an order book, then when I enter something in the order book, I am assured that it will get there. Right. And then when my order is matched with uh, with with the requirements of another person, I get the best price and it it, it executes faithfully. Yeah. So, so those two those these things like embody the notion of uh, trustlessness and security exactly and then the exchange must have uh, liquidity liquidity meaning um, a lot of people that are doing trades concurrently right unless we use a design like bankor which is which is a separate topic in itself so uh, there has to be liquidity and then there has to be low trading cost right so it it should be easy to yeah. trade right and and it should also be quick to trade so i i ent- i enter my transaction it gets quickly accepted and i and i get credited my 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 thing exactly so it's like all of these features have been hard to put into one system until un- until now at least 
Exactly. Yeah. So if you look at uh, other projects uh, like you know Ether Delta or or Bancor or, or even SwapTech and ZeroX, so Ether Delta has been around for like more than a year, I guess. But still, the volume is still high because they they requires you know you know tech you know technical uh, understanding from the users. So so not many people can use it, right? This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. Let's like sort of walk through like all of these projects and the different approaches they are taking. So you said Ether Delta, Swaptech, Zero X, and Bancor. So Ether Delta, what how it works is that it maintains the entire order book on chain. So every time you want to trade something, you have like to to you know send the transaction with your order there. And every time you want like to modify your your order, you have like to send another transaction. So it's it's gonna cost you some transaction fees for for every modification, right? So it's gonna be first of all expensive, uh, because you know now you have like to pay transaction fee for every uh, modification, and it's gonna be uh, uh, it's gonna be expensive for the entire network as well because. Now everyone has like to store their order book on chain, so it's gonna blow up the the state of the entire blockchain. And SwapTech and ZeroX uh, are doing something similar, except that they move the order book off chain. So it's like you know uh, they maintain the the order book between the 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 buyers and the and and and, and the seller uh, off chain, and and there will be like some third party that that match that help them to match. And when the settlement happens, uh, it happens on chain. So the, the, the problem with that is that, uh, so first of all, uh, now we have like, to trust the third party to, to match uh, between the, the buyer and the, and the seller side. And, and there's no guarantee on settlement because, because there's nothing on chain to guarantee that the, set, the settlement will be successful, right? Um, and Bancor, uh, Bancor is is innovative in their in their in their formula uh, that decide the sell and, and and buy price, but you know the problem with that formula is that it has not been tested, and there's no you know guarantee that it's gonna work in practice, right? Uh, and as you have seen, there's a you know low adoption in in uh, in Bancor so far. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's because of you know uh, of the decentralized chains in general or because of the approach that Bancor use. So with Ether Delta, it's like you have the whole order book on chain. So in 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 that case, like who actually does the matching? Uh, the smart contract will will uh, you know do the matching. Okay, but somebody has to trigger the smart contract to match. Right. So it's like you know every time you send the transaction, right? Uh, like you want to sell something. Uh, that transaction will, you know, ch check, you know, on the on on the buy side to to see, you know, if there is any match. Okay, so this must be super resource intense intensive, right? Because like all of these orders have to stay on chain. Like if I put in an order and I cancel it, exactly. it consumes storage and transaction cost, even though no trade really happened. Yeah. Okay. And and you cannot do any like state pruning or anything to reduce the state size of the blockchain. Because you know you, you must you know keep all the orders. But but Ether Delta, even though it has, uh, even though the the design might not be very scalable, Ether Delta does have users today. So there's actually trades happening using using Ether Delta. Exactly. So it 
it is probably one of the first uh, decentralized exchanges that does have some volume right right prior to this probably all the other decentralized exchange ideas didn't was like theoretical concepts that didn't end up getting any volume at all uh banco does get some for the you know banco to ether uh, exchange banco to ether exchange yeah all right so with with banco the advantage is that there is no notion of an order book at all like their exchange technology doesn't have a notion of an order book but on the other side the design of that exchange is new and experimental and it could have have its own challenges that uh, may not be apparent at first sight yeah uh, exactly and swap tech and zero x uh what they essentially do is they end up it's like the order book is off chain but the custodians the smart contracts that are holding the funds are on chain so they ensure um security against loss of funds exactly but they show like security against loss of funds probably some kind of speed and liquidity as well but they are not able to assure the trustlessness in the sense that uh you need to rely on a third party to do the matching exactly and there 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 might be um some in theory the third party could preferentially match and give you a bad deal and itself get a better deal so that tr- so that uh, security element is remo- is is fine but the trustlessness ele- element is is not there yeah Let's talk about the design of the of Kyber Network uh, as it compares perhaps to these other approaches that we've discussed so far. Okay, awesome. So in, in Kyber Network, what we do is, you know, we bring, uh, so first of all, we remove the order book entirely because we realize that it's expensive to, to maintain the order book on chain. And secondly, what we, what we do to uh, guarantee the, the uh, liquidity is that we, uh, we bring, you know, some big market makers on chain by introducing the the concept of reserve. So every time there's a trade comes in, right? Uh, we just go and ask the reserve what is the rate for this, you know, for this pair, and then we just you know f- get the best rate and then you know uh, process the trade and return the tokens to the users. So so there's no order book. Um, the liquidity is guaranteed by all the market makers. And we are we are going to be the first market maker of the first reserve in our system. Um, in terms of trustless, uh, we like everything happens on the contract, so we we cannot like decide on how like who we want to 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 match. It's purely based on you know the rate of you know all the reserve uh, pro- uh, provide. So the the thing I'm, that I'm starting to imagine is that Kaibu network would be something like Shapeshift, right? So. I- I don't know how many of our listeners have used Shapeshift, but in Shapeshift, like if you want to exchange like Bitcoin for Ether, you send Bitcoin for Shapeshift, and Shapeshift the company sends Ether to you. Right. Right. So in in a, in a normal exchange, you are interacting with another person or an entity that is not the company, but like in this case, there's the Shapeshift send money there, and you get the what you want. Right. So what you're trying to build is like Shapeshift, but decentralized. Yeah, so what we are trying to build is shapeshift, but which is decentralized and secure because you know, user they do not need to, to deposit to our to our uh, you know uh, to uh, to our chains. What they need to do is they just need to send the, the ether or tokens to our to our contract, and they will get back whatever they want to trade, right? And it is decentralized uh, in terms of using smart contract and in terms of you know having multiple reserve to pro- to provide the liquidity. So now everyone can be, you know, part, like a- anyone can be a new, you know, shape shift in our system, right? Because they can just register their reserve and, you know, process the trade. So of course, with, with shape shift, the, not to you know, make too many comparisons with this particular uh, uh, product, but in, in the background, what happens is that shape shift is actually connecting you to exchanges and making the trades on your behalf. So there is an order book there. There, there are order books in, in the back end that are, uh, with which your trades are being matched, and that's how they're uh, uh, able to, uh, to 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 provide the liquidity for the for the for the trades. Um, when you say that you remove the order books, can you go a bit more into detail because it's it's not clear to me how you can have a trade without an order book. Are you just simply relying on liquidity provided by uh, reserve 
um, providers that you know they'll, they'll take any amount um, uh, for any type of trade. Right. So, uh, in terms of like, so first of all, we we remove all the order book on chain, right? And and we rely on the reserve to do the uh, you know liquidity providing, right? And what the reserve needs to do uh, in in the backend is that they need to rebalance their portfolio uh, by you know uh, exchanging uh, by by you know uh, converting their coins and token in some other centralized exchanges which they have you know co uh, connection. Uh, so that activity we uh, we we you know we do not like um, concern much because it's, it's the uh, reserve uh, owner's responsibility to do. So the re the reserve provider could be an exchange. Is is this accurate to say that it could be an exchange in the back end? It could be an exchange. It could be individuals with a lot of coins and tokens. Okay, I see. Um, so let's let's go deeper into this, the design here. We, we've talked about the the reserve uh, owners. Can you describe sort of the, the the high level overview of what the Kyber network looks like? Who are the different participants, uh, and uh, how they interact with each other? You know, walk us through a trade, like from from the user's perspective. Walk us through how he, tr you know, where, when he sends the coins to the network, what happens? You know, where is the liquidity coming from? Who interacts with a smart contract, etc. Okay. So it is uh, pretty simple. So if you are a, a user, uh, you send your contract to our Kyber contract. Uh, sorry, you, you, you send your tokens or Ether to our Kyber contract. And our contract will just you know, find the best reserve uh, that provides the best rate for, for, for you. And we just you know, send Ether or token to that reserve and you know, get back the, the uh, converted tokens and, and, and then you know, forward the tokens to you. Everything happens in one transaction. Right, so so here we have the users, we have the Kyber contract, which uh, you know accept the the trading request and and match to the corresponding reserve, and we also have the reserve uh, that provides the liquidity and provide the rate for you know the token pairs, right, and so we also have the Kyber network operators that will uh, you know do the you know listing of the tokens and do the listing of the reserve. Because we need to guarantee that, you know, the reserve will you know, provide enough liquidity for the system, and we also need to do some sort of like KYC check on the reserve before we, uh, you know, have them in our platform. And the reserve will be maintained by you know reserve uh, operator. Uh, that reserve operator can be individual, can be a DAO, a smart contract, uh, or can be a group of people. Um, so basically, we have like five uh, five parties in, in in our in our system: the users, the Kyber contract, the net, uh, Kyber network operator, the reserve, uh, and the reserve operator. Okay. So, for example, if you were if you were to like sort of personify this user, all of these people, it could be that. Um, so let's say, uh, Loy, you are the uh, you are the operator. You are the Kyber network operator. Yes. Right? Uh, I'm like I'm let's say a, a a reserve provider, right? So, so my job is I don't know I have let's say a million ether from somewhere and I'm like putting that million ether on a on a smart contract, and uh, if if somebody wants to buy let's say melon tokens, sell melon tokens and get ether, then the ether I've put on on one of these smart contracts will be used to fill that order, right? Exactly. So, so that's the reserve, and I'm the reserve operator. Uh, Law, you can be the network operator, and the other other party is sort of the smart contract, right? The uh, the Kyber network smart contract, and then Sebastian can be another reserve. So, uh, so I I'm one company providing a reserve. Sebastian is another company providing a reserve. And the two of us are somehow competing in order to get as much volume through our reserves. Because I'm assuming we make some kind of transaction fees. Exactly. So how does the reserve quota price? So how am I, how, so let's say like, so Brian initiates a transaction. He has like 1000 melon coins. He wants 10 ether for those 1000 melon coins. And like he sends the transaction into the, into the blockchain. Now, how does Sebastian and I, how do we indicate that we are willing to accept melon coins and what price we will accept them at? 
Right. So what you need to do is you just need to send a transaction uh, to a Kyber contract to to uh, uh, provide the transaction rate as the the, the trading rate between uh, Melon token and Ether. And you uh, you essentially you have ready to do that every like you know five or ten minutes, uh, depending on you know how frequent you want to update your rate. Yeah. So based on the rate, uh, the Kyber contract will just select the best you know a rate for the users. So if 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 I'm furnishing reserves and my reserves are going to be used in let's say ten different trading pairs like Melon to Ether, I don't know DGD to Melon, like I said, this ten pairs, then I have to keep providing rates for all of these ten pairs. Yeah. So, so reserve management is a very active function, right? Like yes, but but you 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 can like provide uh, you know the update for the ten pairs in one single transaction. So you don't have like, to send like ten different transactions to update, you know, ten different pairs. So in uh, in in this in this great great grander schema, so there's the reserve operator and the reserve manager. Are, are those two different parties? Uh, oh, they 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 are the same. They are the, they same. Are the same party. I'm okay. just messing up with the word. <laughs> okay, okay, understood. And then and then you we are also assuming that like if I'm a reserve, so I sold my ether and got melon, but I might also interface as a reserve with another exchange in the background get rid of the melon and get ether and like replenish my keep replenishing my my my, my reserves exactly yeah right and and how do i make money as as being a reserve as being a reserve you make money from you know all the trading spread right so you make the so every time you make a a a, a uh, you you process a trade you earn some you know trading spread there uh, so that's how you make money by you know joining Kyber Network as a reserve. So in, in some senses, like Kyber Network is not exactly a trustless and secure exchange. It is like it is removing the risk of trust from the user to the reserve provider, right? So the reserve provider now needs to go to a centralized exchange and uh, needs to like do the opposite trade and like keep the reserves replenished. So it's the reserve provider that is taking on that risk exactly. and the user is not taking. So it is normally with, with a user, the user goes to a centralized exchange and is taking the, uh, the risk that the exchange will be hacked or something. But out here, you, you say that the user doesn't need to take that risk, but there are these professionals, which are these reserve providers, they will take that kind of custodial risk. Yeah. On their behalf. So, so in in some sense, you know, all the reserve players, uh, or, or the reserve manager or reserve operators, uh, they they have a lot of coins and tokens, right? And and they are actively, you know, uh, uh, you know, participating in in centralized exchanges already, because you know they they, they make money from being market makers there as well. Uh, so, we do not like increase you know any risks for them at all. Yeah, I, I just hope all of these reserve operators will have good security practices because that this this could be a point of hack. Right. So uh, in the future, we can think of some some model like you know we allow everyone to contribute to the reserve and and build up the reserve uh, via some smart contract like the one that Melonport is building. So in in that scenario, uh, there's no trust on the reserve at all, right? And people can just you know, uh, every time they are they are running lower ether, they can just ask people to you know contribute more ether to the reserve, and they you know they have some incentive to you know, incentivize people to do that. Uh, but it's it's not in the early stage of of Kyber network. Tell us then how how will this play out for the user? Um, it, it, what do you envision in terms of applications or user interfaces for the user to be able to? trade coins using the Kyber network? Do you have like a wallet or are there like third-party applications that are meant to be built on top of APIs that you provide? That's, that's a good question. So we are, we are building our own wallet uh, that, has, and that has all the features that we want to support in Kyber network, but that's not enough because, uh, you know, if there's in cryptocurrencies, they are really loyal. Um, it's, it's hard to like, you know, ask them to, you know, move away from their favorite wallet. So, so what we're trying to do is we, we're trying to bring, you know, Kyber Network to popular wallets like, you know, Status, uh, Miter Wallet and, and others. Uh, so, so if they can just, you know, they can just 
convert the tokens instantly uh, when they are using their wallet. They, they don't have like to go to some centralized exchange or you know uh, some other website to to trade. And do do you envision uh, what kind of like business models do you think can be built on top of this? Because I presume that then uh, as a as a as a DAP provider, you know, applications can be built on top of this, and you're probably thinking of you know different types of business models that people can provide. Exactly. So, uh, so we are thinking of so first of all, um, we can support like you know proxy payments, right? So we we can allow like people to to pay to anyone in any token. Like if you just you know receive if you just want to receive ether, and you know I have only like you know uh, melon pot token. Then I can. What I can do is I can send via Kyber network, and and Kyber network will just you know forward ether to you, and they do the you know conversion from uh, melon token to ether, um, in the background. So 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 that payment service is one of our application. Um, there's another one that is, um, you know, trading advanced uh, financial uh, instruments, something like derivatives and uh, you know hedging. Right, so it's like you know when you invest in some DAO hedge fund, and you are going to like receive your tokens in like three days, uh, but you but you but you see that the rate is is uh, you know at best today, and so what what you can do is you can you can do the you know you can do the trading with Kyber Network like today, to receive the price, uh, the, the 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 best price, and three days later the Kyber Network can you know just do the settlement with the DAO hedge fund, to 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 get your to get your token. Okay, so I, I, I let's go through these different use cases. So the first, in the first use case, you're what what essentially it comes down to is as a merchant, I let's say I accept ether and you have uh, Melonport uh, tokens, and you want to pay me uh, rather than you know trading those tokens on an exchange for ether uh, in my payment platform. You know, I might have. An application or you know some some sort of a an, an API that would allow me to accept those melon port tokens and receive ether right away, um, sort of like what people are doing now with uh, with Shapeshift. Can you describe this uh, uh, this uh, the second use case of hedging? Is the Kyber network providing those features to allow for settlement to happen later? Uh, after a trade was initiated, or is that something that you would be built on top as a, as an, uh, a third party application? Right. So it's going to be a third party ap application because we need like to uh, interact with the with the DAO uh, contract as well. Uh, so we need like to work with the the, the, the counterparty to uh, to implement that feature. So it's it's not going to happen in the early stage of Kyber Network. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. It supposed Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more, keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys. They're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux. You can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone. You can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. And more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure to, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So let's talk about the network operator. Um, can you talk a bit more about the role that the network operator plays in you know, governance of the DAO and some other roles that they may play that we're uh, not seeing here? So the, the only um, role of the network operator uh, in, in Kyber Network is to, to guarantee that you know, the platform happens uh, correctly and there's no, uh, you know, 
So for example, the network operator has to uh, list and delist the token pairs. So you know if some token is is not you know uh, popular and like not many not many people are trading it, then we 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 just, we just delist it, right? And if there's a new token, we need to list it uh, to our platform, and we also need like to to list and delist uh, reserve. Um, and in order to do that, we need like to do background check, uh, to do KYC check, to guarantee that you know the reserve is is. Uh, uh, you know, providing li enough liquidity, they hold enough, you know, portfolio uh, to provide, uh, you know, uh, liquidity in our platform. There's another important role of the network operator that is to to guarantee that there's no bad price for the users. So, so what what we can do is we can provide some sort of guiding price, and if you know some reserve uh, offers some really like you know bad price, uh, we need like to you know stop them from doing that and you know do the investigation uh, in the background so you, you talked about listing and delisting C can you explain or go into detail as to what is the what is the process there like is there a a, a set of criteria is it um, uh, are we talking about something here that also takes in crowd input or is this solely uh, the responsibility of network operators and and my second question my follow-up question would be like who are the people or who are the custodians of uh, of the kyber network there right so uh, in the in in the early stage uh, we so we like as in kyber network people have like to 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 play that role so first of all we need like to do it manually because you know some some tokens they may have a like, different format they may not be like erc20 uh, compatible so so adding them may you know create some some failure to the network so we have like, to do every, everything manually so we have like no criteria in in you know list uh, like list or delist you know tokens as long as you know they are they they won't you know create trouble uh, for the network and and they are you know uh, compatible to the to, to the network who will be the curators of the network like who will have the keys essentially that uh, allows these i guess i guess there must be like a transaction that is sent to uh to the dao uh when you want to list or delist like who who holds those keys initially right uh so in the beginning it's going to be like a few people from kyber network like you know our co-founders and and uh the lead engineers uh, but later on, we we can uh, we can envision the future that you know the the um, you know our token holders will you know vote and decide you know which token to list and delist. Uh, but it's gonna be like in the future, not not in the early stage of Kyber Network. So in general, I think we we are open like to list any tokens. Uh, we we have like you know no uh, like not much concern about listing new tokens at all. Uh, as long as you know they have enough liquidity and and, and you know uh, traction in 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 the uh, community. So one of the questions I I would have here is um, so you have this network operator which is essentially playing some form of administrating yeah. administrator role. It is just ensuring that everything runs smoothly. The right token pairs are there. If there's some fault, there's a way to recover from that fault and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm assuming like this net this network operator can can charge some fees for its service for every transaction, right? Uh, my fundamental question is why decentralize the network operator? Why not keep it centralized? Why not why not just the small team of Kyber Network being the network operator from now on to infinity? Right. Uh, so that's that's the good question because. So first of all, in the early stage, we are not going to like to decentralize that process. Uh, only a few of us will decide, you know, which token to list and which one is to, uh, to delist, right? Because we need, first of all, we need like to to guarantee the liquidity of, of these tokens. Because if there is no reserve, like you know, trading that tokens, then we should not list it, right? Um, uh, but so so the network operator they do not take any fee at all. Uh, or you know at least we do not take any fee at all. Uh, the fee. Uh, so let's talk about the fees later. But um, in the future, I think it's it's good for the for the token holders uh, in in the network to decide you know which token they should list or they should not list, right? Because essentially uh, they are the main uh, you know owner of the platform, not not the you know uh, Kyber network operators. Like not a few of us. 
So that's 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 the you know main reason why we should like decentralize uh, the decision uh, you know whether to list or not to list any tokens. I I see a lot of projects and uh, that have, that have this that that have this idea that they are going to decentralize some function over over a lot of people. Yeah. Right? So out here you have these decisions, uh, the network operation decisions, and you're saying when you start out, probably it's your startup. There are like three or four people that are going to make those decisions and they're going to make the platform run well. And then you're saying from three or four people, you're going to go to at least 400 or 500 people when when you go to the DAO. Right. Now, now let's assume that there is some economic value to this activity. Meaning, let's say, I don't know, let's say there's like $1 million in in trades happening in your platform or let's say 10 million dollars on trades whatever and this network operator is making i don't know 0.5% 0.25% percent out of it so if it's 10 million dollars um this becomes like 25000 dollars a year now this 25000 dollars a year is being paid to the operator and right now with your startup there's only like four people that are playing the role of the network operator so each one of your employees that is is doing activity worth 6.25k right six six thousand two hundred fifty dollars now when you decentralize it to like 400 or 500 people the same decision making process when, when it's decentralized over four people each one is doing activity worth six two five zero dollars and it makes sense for a human to learn this thing and do that for six thousand two hundred fifty dollars, if you decentralize it over four hundred people now, then each person is going to only make uh, I don't know sixty two dollars, and they have to learn how to make these decisions in order to uh, be a good network operator. So I think like my my feeling is going from four to four hundred is not going to make sense in terms of time. Like if I become a Kyber Network token holder. I need to learn how to do all of this voting and stuff, make all these decisions. But what I'm being effectively paid for is just like sixty-two dollars a year. Do you face this kind of problem in your in in your design? Right. So, um, so voting is is always a, a good question. Like, uh, how how do you like incentivize people to vote? Um, if you if you see from most of the election, like even in the U.S., you know, like we have like fifty percent of people like. Know, appear and you know vote right uh, because essentially they, they they don't see you know much you know incentive for them to to go and vote um, and and make the decision for the entire system because you know someone else will do that for them um, so we we haven't like you know uh, dive much into you know this this you know concern because our, 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 our only concern now is to you know develop the platform and and you know make it run as soon as possible but I think that's that's a good question to to think of in 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 the long run, like you know how to govern and how how to develop a uh, governance model uh, that you know can incentivize people to vote and and you know and like you know make it like practical one. The governance issue is 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 a is a really important issue. And I I personally feel that a lot a lot of projects right now are are focusing on new types of innovative use cases and. Are not addressing the the question of governance. I'm 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 not sure if it's because governance is hard or maybe it's just not very interesting. Uh, you know, if if you compare it to some of these other uh, interesting use cases that are being developed, or maybe because you know, we're waiting for uh, for other uh, projects like you know Decred or Tezos to solve those issues. But it is something that at some point you know, we're going to have to address if, if we're talking about you know decentralization and at the core of it, there's there is a team that is managing um, the keys to a DAO that will continue to remain a somewhat centralized system. So, uh, one, one point or another, we will have to face the issue of decentral of uh, of decentralized governance, uh, no matter how complex or or uninteresting it may be from a you know, user facing point you know use case kind of, kind of point of view. Okay, um, I think I think that's that's a that's a valid concern. Uh, but like so for uh, so in Kyber network, um, decentralized governance is is not uh, something really important because you know what the most uh, that the network operator can do 
they can just list or delete some token, right? They they cannot like you know uh, hold user fund or you know hold a reserve uh, fund, or they cannot like you know go away with others' money. So so it's it's not you know some security concern or you know even like just less um, concern that that we need to address in 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 the near future. No, I I think that's I think you're right there, but. One one thing that uh, 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 network operators might be able to do is you know, up, upgrades to the protocol. And once you have something that has a lot of value uh, and you get into these uh, decisions having to do with upgrades to the protocol and, and how those play out, then you fall into you know, similar situations as we've seen in Bitcoin recently, where you have a lot of value behind a certain network and... Um, uh, there, there are factions that you know may want to go in one direction or another, and that's where I think governance, uh, you know, will play a major role, uh, not not just in the decentralized uh, aspect right. of it, and you know, whether or not the the the, the app the DAP can can uh, can run away with your with your funds, but how, what is the governance around how the system continues to evolve and upgrade? Yeah, so 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 I think if if we are you know if we uh, ever go into that point, uh, that's that's a good problem to have because now the system like there's no much uh, so much stake in 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 the system, so people will have like more incentive to vote and and you know to uh, to participate in the the governance right, um, so I, I guess that will address the incentive issue that that was just raised like five minutes or two minutes ago. Yeah, if if the system becomes very successful, then there will actually be incentive for people to learn and participate in governance. If you want like 400 people to participate in decision making, you realistically need a trade volume of 100 to 500 million dollars in order to have sufficient incentive for that to happen. Yeah, I agree. Right. Right. So it is certainly that it is certainly like some some ways out before uh, that incentive structure is created. Otherwise, you will you will only end up getting voters that really don't care, because their effort is only worth I don't know one hundred dollars a year. <laughs> yeah, which is like which is like tiny, right? Like uh, you could you could you could make more doing an epicenter episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right, which so, isn't a lot, by the way. Yeah. Okay. So if if you take a look at at the trading volume, uh, at the daily trading volume of you know all the cryptocurrency now, it's like more than one billion dollars per day, right? So if if we like you know can take like one percent of, of 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 the pie, then it's gonna be like you know a lot per year. So with with a lot of with a lot of these decentralized exchange projects that are built on Ethereum, it, you know the, the the focus has been mostly on trading Ether for other ERC twenty tokens, and and it it, it appears that when you want to interface those decentralized exchanges with other blockchains, say Bitcoin, Zcash, or or other um, decentralized internet platforms like Cosmos, Polkadot, uh, etc., uh, it, it it sort of becomes kind of hacky, and you need to have intermediaries there or some sort of gateway or something like that. So, how will users be able to, or is this part of the roadmap? For users to be able to trade, say for instance, Ether or ERC twenty tokens with uh, Bitcoin, Zcash, or through other uh, platforms, what what do you envision there in the future? So there are several like approaches to to do like you know cross cross cryptocurrency trading, right? Uh, so we can we can wait for Cosmos and and uh, Polkadot uh, to uh, and and use these protocols to to support that features. Another approach which is already practical and existing that is to use all the chain relays, and uh, we just so just like two or three weeks ago we, we made a, a good progress in building the BIS relay between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. So now you can basically trustlessly move your uh, ETC to Ethereum and allowing people you know to trade uh, between ETH and you know any ERC twenty tokens to ETC. Uh, so that's that's already practical and, and you can you know do it today right and there is also BTC relay uh, which is uh, which, ha- which was built like a year ago by uh, Joseph Zo- Chow um, so but you know still you you need you know some hacking there in order to make BTC relay practical uh, but I think it's not hard uh, we just released a blog post like uh, a week ago to discuss about our approach in in you know trading uh, different cryptocurrencies. 
Uh, and after Metropolis, I think um, building uh, a relay for Zcash is going to be practical because uh, you know Ethereum will support uh, uh, you know uh, zero knowledge operation, and also they may uh, you know support uh, the the hash function of of Zcash proof of work, so that we can practically you know build a Zcash relay on Ethereum and allowing people to trade between. Zcash and you know any uh, ERC twenty tokens or even Ethereum. So before we wrap up, uh, tell us where you are in terms of developing this platform and what's your roadmap for the future. Right. Uh, so we are releasing our uh, our demo or our testnet deployment in two days, two or three days from now. Uh, so we are we are pretty close to the to the mainnet deployment. Uh, so we are targeting, uh, you know, the end of this year uh, to for our, you know, mainnet release uh, that will allow you to trade between, uh, you know, Ethereum and any ERC twenty tokens. Um, and our our roadmap has several, uh, you know, major releases. Um, we are going to have a release that allows you to support to to tra- uh, to 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 do all the, you know, uh, payment services, like you know, you can pay anyone in any tokens. Uh, we also have a, a, another release that allows you to, uh, you know, uh, trade between like advanced financial uh, uh, instruments like you know hedging derivatives, um, and the 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 another major release will allow you to trade between different cryptocurrencies. And by then, uh, we we expect that you know Metropolis is already uh, released, and uh, hopefully Cosmos and Polkadot is. Uh, Will be launched by then as well. Otherwise, we we'll, we'll, we will just go with all the chain relays approach that that we have. And what's the business model here? How do you plan to make money with this? Right. Uh, so we are going to to take a cut from you know all the transaction or all the trade uh, in in our platform. So first of all, the the company uh, is not going to to you know take any fees or any share from that. Uh, all the transaction holder will uh, you know you know enjoy that that transaction fees. Uh, and and we are still working on 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 the on the model for that. Does uh, your company plan to be, for instance, like on the also on the reserve side? Do you plan to also provide liquidity in in the network somehow, or would you strictly be on the technology side and as operators of the network? Right. So when we first launched, we need like to 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 provide and maintain the first reserve of the system before others can you know participate and guarantee enough liquidity for the platform. So in the beginning, we must you know play both the roles: uh, the platform provider and you know a reserve provider. Where will you get these reserves? Like, what are are you partnering with exchanges, or will you have the reserves to? So that's that's why we need the the the, the crowd sale. Uh, so part part of the uh, money raised in the crowd sale is gonna be spent on the reserve. Okay, so the, the, there will be a crowd sale at one point. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lloyd, for coming on today and telling us about Kyber Network. Uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing how the project develops and uh, how how it will play out in you know, in this ecosystem of the decentralized exchanges. I think that uh, uh, this is a this is. A space that will continue to evolve and uh, it, this type of decentralized platform providing liquidity and providing uh, the uh, instantaneous uh, trades is uh, something that will be sorely needed once as, as more and more cryptocurrencies enter, enter the ecosystem. Thank you both for having me. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, if you like the show, you can support us. And there's multiple ways you can do that. You can leave us a review on iTunes or any of the platforms you listen. Uh, and you can also leave us a tip. Our tipping address will be in the show description. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.